Good evening. It's great to see all of you here on this beautiful June evening. Um, we, we are delighted to have all of you here for this latest event in the Institute of Politics ongoing speaker series. I'm Steve Edwards, the executive director. And uh, I am pleased to have on stage to my left uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and Rachel Bronson, who runs the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, two of the most astute chroniclers and analysts of foreign policy and international affairs on the scene today. I think those of you who are regular readers of both publications know what I'm talking about. In particular, in Jeffrey's case, um, if you've read his recent extended conversations with both President Obama and Henry Kissinger, you know uh, what I'm talking about, among many other things. Um, this series is part of our ongoing series of conversations in winter quarter that are focused on America and the Trump era. And so we have been looking at a range of issues from immigration to health care, from media and culture now, of course, to foreign policy. It's part of our speaker series, the goal of which is to elevate and expand the public conversation around key issues of the day. Um, and the mission of the IOP is to cultivate and inspire the next generation of public service leaders. So in keeping with that mission, when we turn to audience questions a bit later on this evening, uh, we ask that the first three questions be reserved for students before we open up the floor to everyone thereafter. We also ask, as is customary here, that you keep your questions short and to the point so that we can get to as many of you as possible tonight. A couple of quick program notes, including a few things coming up later this week. On Thursday, night at Mandel Hall at 7 o'clock. Uh, the IOP, in collaboration with a host of other university partners, will be hosting an Intelligence Square debate. And if you're not familiar with an Intelligence Square debate, these are Oxford-style debates uh, featuring two teams of debaters going after a critical motion uh, that's timely and topical. In this case, the motion is, the political establishment has failed America. There will be two teams of debaters, including Michael Eric Dyson of Georgetown and William Howell of the University of Chicago. Um, teaming up against uh, Jennifer Rubin of the Washington Post and Eric Oliver of the University. It should be a great conversation. Um, we welcome you to join us for that event. And again, the following day on Friday at noon, S.E. Cup and Van Jones will be in conversation looking at divisions in America today, continuing an ongoing series that they're doing. Also, next Monday, we'll be back in this very room hosting a discussion that takes a look at the future of the Democratic Party. Some of you may have been with us last week where we did the same for the future of the Republican Party. Um, David Axelrod will um, be in conversation with some of the top young minds in the party, including South Bend, Indiana Mayor and DNC uh, Chair Candidate Pete Buttigieg, uh, Mayor Kasim Reed of Atlanta, and Simone Sanders, who was former communications chair for Bernie Sanders' campaign. You can find out more about all of that on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Now is a good time to make sure your phones are on silent, and it's a good time for me to exit the stage and bring up to the stage Con Olgan, who's a fourth year here in the college. He has been a leading member of the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Board and a host of other initiatives on campus. He's majoring in political science, and he will formally introduce our two speakers tonight. Please join me in welcoming Con Olgan to the podium. Con. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Jeffrey Goldberg, and our moderator, Rachel Bronson, for a discussion on the foreign policy agenda of the Trans Trump administra administration. Jeffrey Goldberg is the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic Magazine. After serving as an accomplished correspondent of the magazine for nine years, writing 11 cover stories during that time, he became the 14th person to hold that spot in the magazine's 160-year-long history. Before joining The Atlantic, Mr. Goldberg was the Middle East and Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. Previously, he was a correspondent for The New York Times Magazine, New York Magazine, and The Washington Post. In his career as a successful journalist, he has won numerous awards, including the National Magazine Award for Reporting in 2003, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists Prize for the Best International Investigative Journalist, the Overseas Press Club Award for the Best Human Rights Reporting, and the Anti-Defamation League's Daniel Pearl Prize. His 2006 book, Prisoners, A Story of Friendship and Terror, was named as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times. Dr. Rachel Bronson, the executive director and the publisher of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, 
will be moderating tonight's discussion. The bulletin just this past month released a famous doomsday clock statement, moving it two and a half minutes to midnight, 30 seconds closer than 2016. Midnight on this context is a symbolic moment of humankind's destruction of itself. The bulletin cited President Trump's previous statements as the primary reason for doing so. Before joining the bulletin, Dr. Bronson served in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for eight years in many capacities, including as the Council's Vice President of Programs and Studies. Previously, she was a Senior Fellow and the Director of Middle East Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. Tonight, we are honored to have them both at our Institute of Politics, so please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Goldberg and Rachel Bronson with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Let me make sure my mic is on. It sounds like it is. Um, Jeffrey, welcome to the University of Chicago. Um, and congratulations to the Institute of Politics for continuing to host such great conversations and bring out this kind of, of audience. From your bio, you're clearly an underachiever, so I'm not sure what we're going to have to talk about tonight. <laughs> um, so the, the title of tonight's program is American Foreign Policy in an Age of Trump. And what I thought that we would do is start off with just American foreign policy, some of the challenges that any president would face. American then, foreign policy until Trump. Until Trump. Right. So we know what the groundwork looks right like. And right off the, and then yeah. We'll see where it takes us. Um, and then also I do, at the end, if we get a chance to it, I do, because we have so many students here talk about what some ethical issues that, uh, that uh, students may face if they were serving. When do you serve and when do you don't? And when might you not? Some of the things we talked about on, on the phone. Um, so let's just start. You, as Steve mentioned, you did this tremendous bookends, if you will, interviews, where you interviewed Obama and kind of came up with the Obama doctrine, and you then um, interviewed Henry Kissinger for his take on this. And together, it gives you this very full picture of all the challenges that right. America finds on its plate. So maybe we can just um, start off and to kind of bring everyone up to speed on what was the Obama doctrine that you, that you were writing about, and then Kissinger's response, because that will give us a sense of what any president, whether it was a Bush, a Romney, a McCain, a Cruz, now a Trump would have faced the kind of bigger challenges. Right. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to the Institute and David and everybody. Uh, Rachel, thank you for doing this. Uh, so the, the, the joke of the, of the Obama doctrine is that, there, that in his mind, there is no Obama doctrine. Um, and, and I actually sort of knew that. I mean, this is about a year ago or a year and a half ago when I was uh, working on this piece about, about the Obama foreign policy. Uh, we were, of course, casting about for a cover line, a, a headline. They have to be short. And the then editor-in-chief, James Bennett, who is now the opinion editor, the editorial page editor of the New York Times, um, said, let's call it the Obama Doctrine. And, and I said, that's fine, uh, except there actually is no Obama Doctrine. And he said, well, not having a doctrine is a form of having a doctrine. <laughs> And that's why he's so successful. Um, the, uh, but but there's, there's, something, there's something to that. And the president, after this article came out, the president um, said uh, that, you, you, I mean, he's, he, he said this. I'll just state that he said this. Um, that uh, that you know, he, he sardonically noted that, I didn't know that I had a doctrine until the Atlantic told me that I had a doctrine. Um, that, that said, um, there are obviously some, some through lines uh, uh, that, that you can identify. Uh, and one of them is, is quite obviously the, the, the bar for military action was set extraordinarily high in this administration. Obviously, every presidency is a reaction to the previous presidency. Uh, and, and so uh, he learned from watching George W. Bush uh, the, the perils of overreaction. There's a critique, of course, of Obama that he overlearned the lessons about the perils of overreaction and therefore underreacted in a place like Syria, for instance. Uh, but, but the bar is set extraordinarily high for military action. And there is a, 
uh, at its deepest level, there is a, an aspect of the Obama doctrine. He would probably disagree with this. But one aspect is, is that, that when you make foreign policy, when you make national security policy, when you decide to use military force, uh, you have to be extremely cognizant of the fact that America can make things worse. This is not a usual presidential thought. Um, this is what made him somewhat novel. He had a tragic understanding, obviously born of the Iraq experience, that, that the American impulse, you know, don't just stand there, do something, which is the classic American impulse about everything, um, gets us into more trouble than it's worth. Another aspect that I don't want to go in, uh, the, the article was 19,000 words. I could yeah. just read it to you if you want it. Um, <laughs> but that would be thrilling, by the way. Um, the, uh, but there's another, another aspect of this, which is that he was unusually sensitive, and I think this is by, by, by the nature of his, his biography, by the nature of growing up where he grew up. Uh, he was unusually sensitive, and to his critics, overly sensitive to America's, uh, to some of the blemishes in the American foreign policy record. The caricature of Obama drawn by his opponents in the Republican Party, certainly, uh, was that he was always going around apologizing for America. He wasn't going around apologizing constantly for America. Uh, he did believe that America was an indispensable nation, was the indispensable nation. He had his own definition of American exceptionalism. Uh, but he did feel as if when you're talking to Indonesia, Argentina, Iran, countries like that, where we, during the course of the Cold War, waging the Cold War, did certain things, um, he felt like, an American president was obligated to go and say and, and, and acknowledge that, that history. That was an innovation. There are plenty of innovations in his foreign policy, but those are three that sort of give you the, the sense of it. Um, very briefly, mm -hmm. if there's an overarching critique that Kissinger made, uh, uh, it's, that, it's that Obama did not understand the relationship between power and diplomacy, which is to say uh, that he was so hesitant to use American power, except when the threshold was, a very, very high threshold was reached, uh, that, that he did not, um, he, he was not an effective maker of foreign policy because uh, no one was scared of us, is essentially uh, a part of the argument, that, that in order to get something done in Syria, which is obviously the gravest foreign policy crisis of the Obama period, in order to get something done in, in Syria, you need to have the Assad regime's allies, Iran and Russia, believe that you are going to use force in order to achieve your diplomatic goals. And by the way, which is very interesting and, and semi-tragic in a way, John Kerry, uh, who was his second term uh, Secretary of State, also believed this and would argue to the president that I can't get anywhere in my conversations my negotiations with the Russians, with Iran, uh, because no one thinks that you're willing to put your money where your mouth is. He wouldn't put it quite like that to the president, but you get the point. Um, and, and, and so what, what's so fascinating about this, and Kissinger took a certain satisfaction in this, because remember, John Kerry, how did he begin his public life? A, as a Vietnam War dissenter, as a protester, first as a soldier, obviously a sailor, and then as a dissenter. And so, you, so Kissinger took a certain amount of satisfaction in watching uh, Kerry transmogrify from a guy who thought that Kissinger was a war criminal um, to a guy who's asking the president to bomb Bashar al-Assad in order to prove that America is credible when it makes a demand on something. So, so that, was, that was one interesting, again, but these are endless interviews, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff to plumb. So the thing that um, also was so amazing is in your conversations then with Kissinger, you spoke to him right after, the, after Trump had won, and he was surprised. Well, no, no, before. Wasn't it right, there, there was an interview. Oh, no, no, there was no, an it, inter it was after he won the nomination, right, but, right. but before, before the election. Okay, because he said at one point. And then I talked to him for one final time, one very quick conversation right after, right, where he said, I knew it, which is something like that, you know. He, he, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he, what he struck me too, and because this kind of brings us up to where we are now, is that he, he what he also said was that he thought, every, uh, he thought most countries would take a wait and see approach. Yeah. You know, the question is, what are we going to do well, in this Sweden. anticipated <laughs> vacuum? They're declaring <laughs> exactly. we're going to be at war by tomorrow. Um, very unexpected. Um, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, no. as they say on Monty Python. <laughs> so, um, 
the key question I just asked on Twitter, and probably should just delete this, um, was if we go to war with Sweden, which side will Australia take? <laughs> Everyone's off no, balance. we don't know. These are a whole new set of issues that we have to confront. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, I didn't mean no, to interrupt it's you with that. I mean, it, it does leave you a bit speechless. There's something speechless. very low about reciting <laughs> one's tweets, right? You know? Well, since you're deleting them, we get back yeah, well, behind the curtain. It's too late for that. Um, so, so one of the things I was struck by was, uh, so Kissinger said that, there, you know, that, that states like Russia, like Iran, like China would take a wait and see approach as they try to figure out, yeah. you know, kind of what, what Trump would, would bring. Um, and, and I'm curious kind of now whether you think that's the approach they're taking. We're only a month into it, so we're so, but it seems like there's been a lot of testing around the, the, mm -hmm. The edges. There's, you know, the Russians are testing the Chinese, and there's, there's kind of no pushback because there's nobody at home. Do you think that the, the big? Um, no, I mean, I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable description of the National Security Council right now. I, I don't, I don't think that's unfair. Is that there is sort of no one at home. They just appointed another National Security Advisor today, and we'll see. But yep. the systems aren't. There's not people in the positions yeah, that need yeah, to that yeah. you need to respond, and so um, at this this moment, when when you look across the the landscape, um, does it do 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 you agree with Kissinger's assessment at this point that countries are going to take a wait and see? Are you seeing evidence that they're beginning to say, well, as they try, they're taking an awful long time to get their guys in place. Let's begin to do what we what we can. I mean, uh, on the. On the one hand, I mean, so, so, so writ large in a kind of way, I, I think we're still in the prologue or in the overture of the Trump presidency, especially as it relates to foreign policy, national security policy, because nothing actually has happened yet. I mean, you think of all the drama of the last 30 days, it's been largely self-generated mm -hmm. uh, drama. There, it's not, there hasn't been a grotesque violation of international norms by North Korea. There hasn't been, thank God, an ISIS attack, either at home or, or abroad against an American target. Um, and, and I think largely it is true. There are plenty of opportunity for China on any given day to test American resolve in the South China Sea, for instance. And there obviously is plenty of opportunity for Putin to, um, I mean, he could mess around in any one of half a dozen playgrounds bordering his, uh, bordering his, his territory. Uh, in Ukraine, in Moldova, in the Baltics, and, and you haven't seen that. The Iranians are adhering to the, to the deal. Um, they haven't pushed very hard against the Navy in the Gulf. Uh, so I think that's largely true. I mean, there is this Russian spy ship off of Connecticut now, and that might be a partially a, a, a reflection of a need because Obama closed down those two listening posts, those you know weekend homes in, in uh, wherever Long Island. Uh, and, and so the Russians sort of went, went blind when those things were shut down. So they need to have ships right off of, um, off of the East Coast. Um, but I tend to look at this as sort of all the things that haven't happened rather than some of the things that have. I don't think that we've seen. There was going to be a test. There's going to be something that happens. Uh, you saw this repeatedly in the Obama period, uh, uh, Navy uh, sailors straying in the Gulf and getting captured for 12 hours or so by the Iranian Navy. Um, that's going to be a hell of a thing um, if that happens again. Uh, any number of things can happen. But I would say largely, lar I think leaders around the world are so flummoxed. Uh, I don't, you know, and, and, and by the way, this is an advertisement in some ways for unpredictability. You know, the, 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 one of the critiques of Obama uh, is that he never employed the crazy Nixon. You know, he never, you, you know, this was something that Kissinger, as you know, would do. He would go to world leaders and say, look, I know what we need to do, but my boss is crazy. You don't know what that guy's capable of. And it's a great negotiating Mattis tactic. Matt is trying that yeah, in Europe right yeah, now. Yeah, well, Matt, 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 yeah, yeah, well, he doesn't have to try. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, no, 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 I mean, he doesn't, you don't have to, he, he, if anything, he has to sort of say, no, 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 he's not what you think he is. Uh, whether he believes it or not is another question, but he's got to sort of make that, make that argument. Um, but, you know, I, I think everybody is so flummoxed by, because this is a really novel, we're in the middle of a very novel experiment in uh, American global leadership right now. And, and if you were sitting in a foreign, first of all, you're sitting in a foreign capital, you're like you know, the CEO of uh, 
carrier or Boeing or um, what was the department store he attacked? Like Nordstrom's. Um, you know, you're, you're, first of all, like all of a sudden you're Sweden. You're having a night. Nothing happens, right? Like you're the, do they have a prime minister? I guess they have a prime minister, right? Um, you're the prime minister of Sweden. I'm not insulting Sweden. I just didn't know what it's called. There's a king and a prime minister. So you're the prime minister of Sweden and another week has gone by and you're just Sweden, right? And then all of a sudden the president of the United States, you know, goes off on you and you have no idea why. Um, and, and so you're like the president of Nordstrom's in that sense, you know, like you just, you're just, everybody's sort of waiting to be attacked or waiting to have some weird commentary made. And so everybody is just in this wait and see, like trying to keep their heads low. Maybe this is an extraordinarily effective way to go about managing the world. Um, I don't think so, but you know, they're, they're, the, 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 this unpredictability has a way of sort of making everybody adhere to rules because they fear that the American president won't adhere to any rules anymore. Yeah, and I mean, there's two ways we can go on that. Some uh, kind of on the rules of the system, it was pretty interesting that China has seemed to step up and say, well, we need to support the rules of, of the global economic order and will be kind of the, the upholders of yeah. that. In a, and the rest of the world is saying, really? You? Really? Yeah, well, yeah. It, but those are the, right, those are the kinds of opportunities also that they might begin to identify where if, if the U.S. isn't taking a leadership role, um, others can, can certainly step up to it. Right. Um, so uh, I'm kind of curious also about your views of, of China at the moment. Um, well, let me just step back on this madman, uh, kind of the, Nix, the Nixon, Nixon did identify this kind of madman approach where it was very unpredictable. If, if you're sitting there and you think America is overextended, look, Barack Obama thought that mm -hmm. America was overextended um, and has not pulled itself back as far, mm -hmm. all of this is probably okay, right? Which is, it's time for someone else to step up. NATO hasn't been making its commitments. China hasn't been pulling its weight. Others haven't. Well, there's something really interesting in this, which is that, I mean, nobody who supports Barack Obama wants to hear this, but in some ways, Donald Trump is, finds himself, places himself on a continuum with Barack Obama in, in the thinking of foreign policy. Now, now, Donald Trump's foreign policy, to the extent that we can identify a foreign policy or a set of policies, is, is in a way a funhouse mirror version of Barack Obama's foreign policy. But Obama gets into trouble or gets, in, gets criticized when he says to me in that set of interviews uh, in reference to NATO allies, he says, free riders aggravate me, meaning uh, countries that don't pay their share. So Donald Trump takes that to 11 and, and, you know, and he says, why are we in NATO? Not something, that's not something Barack Obama would ever articulate, uh, he would ever say in public. Uh, but you know, there is this, that, 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 that Trump, follows Obama somewhat naturally in the sense that Obama questioned some of the underlying assumptions of American foreign policy making and global leadership in the post-World War II era. Hillary Clinton was going to return us to the norm, uh, Trump taking us in completely different and unusual ways, but, but they are not, you know, they're not from separate planets in terms of their understanding. President Obama was a, a realist and somewhat transactional in the way he approached the role. Trump is purely transactional, obviously, but th there's something here that, that's interesting. And so the, the larger, deeper question is, are these two men in their own ways, one in a kind of sober-minded, let's test some theses, and the other in kind of a whatever you call that thing, <laughs> um, are both, the question is, are they reflecting something true about the American people and their desires related to what role their country, they believe their country should play in the world. It, it, it becomes a fatiguing thing over 70 or 80 years to carry these loads, especially if people are telling you that it's becoming a fatiguing thing to carry these loads over and over again. I thought a perfect example of what you're saying actually was when the, the president kind of very casually talked about the two-state solution or the one-state solution in the Middle East, whatever the parties can agree to. He, yeah, that was like the behind. ultimate YOLO moment of the administration <laughs> so far. One state, two states, three whatever states, you can live with. four states. But was, what, was, what I thought was so interesting about that is there's always been this mantra that the U.S. can't want peace in the region more than the parties. Yeah. And, you know, 
I certainly think all of this should be well calculated. Everyone should be prepared for what's about to be said. But I wondered if kind of an extension of what you're saying, which was there's the kind of calculation and then he just kind of spouts off on it, but the sense of, look, the Israelis have a lot to lose for a one-state solution. The Palestinians have a lot to lose in a one-state solution. Yeah. Each have things to gain from a two-state. Each have things to lose from a two-state. So this is, and it's changing dynamically in a way that our policy hasn't changed. I wonder if that sense of, of that, bah, you know, one, two, whatever the parties want, I can live with. It suggests a lack of planning for what it should be, but it does make them all wonder, like, do we really want the one state solution that the Palestinians have in mind is very different than a one state solution than the Israelis this have is in not mind. The way, this is not the way that professional diplomats would go about questioning the underlying assumptions of American foreign policy, right? On the other hand, it provokes a lot of interesting discussions about what it is that we're doing and what it is that people want. I mean, I was talking to David before, David Axelrod before about this, and you know, there's this, you know, Jared Kushner is gonna be the Middle East peace negotiator, and of course that makes people laugh. Um, it, but on the, on the other hand, we've had 40 or 50 really skilled Middle East peace negotiators the last 40 years, um, and it hasn't worked. So, so there is this kind of throw it against the wall, see what happens uh, <laughs> approach. You know, I can't, I can discount it 97.2%, yeah. but I'm not going to discount it 100% because, because who knows. Th that said, this is not normal. <laughs> I mean, no, right and, 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 and you know, and, and I go back to this point that yeah. nothing has happened yet. Yeah. We have had no international crises of note uh, yet in the, in the month that, that he's been uh, president. So, so when you're the president of the United States and you say, I don't know, one state or two states, whatever, um, and your secretary of state is flying and he, 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 he finds out from CNN that the president and his boss um, has just renounced 40 years or 30 years of American foreign policy mm -hmm. doctrine. Uh, that's kind of like, uh, it's not, this is not stable. It's easy to talk about these things theoretically, but when something happens, uh, there has to be a process, there has to be some stability, there has to be a, a government that speaks with one voice. Everybody around the world, you know, this is the, as you well know, the, the, ba uh, the secret of the world order is that there are a lot of people who resent the United States for being the global hyperpower. There are also a lot of countries, often the same countries, who are grateful that somebody is doing this work. We'll criticize them, we'll, we'll, we'll mock right. America, we'll complain about it, uh, but they're glad that somebody is doing it. And so this is, this is this, the new period we're entering is, is a, 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 a White House that is no longer a stable platform. So this, this for me raises some of like, the ethical questions around what do you do as a career uh, foreign service officer? What do you do as the professional staff in an administration that doesn't seem to be taking all of your work, kind of life's work seriously? What is the role of the careerist? What is the role of the intelligence community? What is the role of the media? I wonder if we could kind of go through that one after another. I don't think there's any easy answers, but we have, we have public policy students here who are thinking about it, um, there was a large resignation of, uh, of career foreign service that um, left the, he asked many of them to hand in their resignations, but there were many who said this was now the time uh, to resign, and we know that there was the thousand or so who wrote the dissent on the, the kind of safe channel. Do you have any thoughts about you know, how, how they should be thinking about, what is the role to serve to ensure that there's someone home when the phone call comes, right. but also if you don't agree with where your boss is going, how, these are really tough decisions. Well, you know, Jim Mattis is a perfect example, right? Uh, I mean, there are there are people who might look at uh, a well-respected warfighter and intellectual leader of the Marine Corps going into this administration, saying, "Why are you doing this?" On the other hand, I would say, I don't have any problem saying this, that I feel somewhat better as an American citizen knowing that Jim Mattis is there in that role, a responsible grown-up who understands these processes, uh, who is in the chain of command, uh, and so you, know, you can be a purist and, and say, well, you know, Donald Trump is, uh, is an X, Y, or Z, so therefore I don't want anything to do with him, but we have a government. 
the, the system produced Donald Trump as president. He's going to be president for four years unless something happens, you know, and, uh, and who knows, impeachment. I mean, God knows in this situation, right? But he's president, and we have a government, and it has to run, and there are matters of life and death uh, that the government is responsible for, and so you'd rather have people in than not. It's an interesting question also in the, I think about the, when you bring this up, I, I think about uh, the Samantha Power uh, conundrum, if you will. Samantha Power writes a book as a journalist mm -hmm. denouncing successive presidents for not intervening earlier or at all in genocides, right? The heroes of her book, which is a great book, won a Pulitzer Prize, the heroes are State Department officials, uh, in the Bosnian case in particular, uh, who resign in protest of American inaction, right? So then Samantha Power goes in the government, um, she works for a president who has uh, uh, not intervened in a, in a genocide-like situation in Syria, half a million people dead, uh, had plenty of opportunity to use military force to try to change the balance, uh, to change that dynamic, and, and didn't, and stays, and stays in, you know? And, and, and it, so it's interesting if the next Samantha Power is gonna write about a book about this Samantha Power, and it's gonna be like Samantha Power's book about previous officials, and, and I'm not sitting here in judgment, but I haven't talked to her lately about this, and I mean, I, I've talked to her enough and listened to her enough to know that some of the things that go through a person's mind are, I can't do all the good in the world, but if I'm here, I can do, I can't, maybe I can't fix Syria, but I can fix Congo, so why would I quit in pro meaningless protest Nothing's gonna change if I quit, but then I can't do the work in X, Y, or Z that I can do. And, and I'm, maybe just because I'm getting older or whatever, and you sort of realize how complicated everything is. Um, I think 20 years ago, I probably would have been, you gotta quit and, just, and resign in disgust and make a stand. And now it's sort of like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, certainly look, look if, you, if you find yourself in an NSC right now, where you're actively not being listened to, where it doesn't matter what you do or say, and this is the danger, obviously, then after a while, I think you probably just give up. Uh, and you go out in public and say, look, this is the dis these are the dysfunctions of the system. Wake up, American people. Wake up, Congress. Wake up, whoever you're trying to wake up. But I, I don't think there's anything I don't think there's anything easy in these, in these questions. Well, that the, the Samantha Powers makes me think of H.R. McMaster actually coming in as our new national security advisor. He right. wrote a very well-regarded book saying the dereliction of duty was the Joint Chiefs of Staff not, not st um, really pushing for um, military policies that they thought would work in Vietnam and for the civilian leadership for not taking it serious, taking um, Vietnam right. as seriously as it needed to be. So he's a really interesting guy coming right. into, the, he's written the book He's written the book, the book about civil military relations uh -huh. in the White House. And the role of, e uh, role of each in pushing back on civilians. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting time, yeah, isn't he's it? An inter he's it's really a very interesting, interesting time. So there's an, I think there's an interesting question. What, if, what about the um, intelligence community? You know, we're hearing a lot about these leaks. You're starting to hear things about deep state. You've worked in the Middle East. You know deep states when you see them. Yeah, yeah. What, you know, what's your sense about kind of leaks versus deep state? Where It seems so there's pernicious. There's no deep state, first of all. Right. We don't have a deep state. We don't have an anti-democratic cabal located in all these government. All, we, we have career civil servants and officials who want to get their points across and, and want to be able to feed the information that they have and the analysis that they have into the system and have it recognized at the pinnacle of the system. You know, the, intel the intelligence community is a 30 billion or 30 billion plus institution um, with one client. As I say, you know, there's only one client for the, for the intelligence community, it's the President of the United States. They want the President of the United States to, to read their product, to understand uh, from that, I mean, it's an amazing thing if you think about it. It all funnels to one guy, um, and and that guy has decided that the intelligence community is against him. And I understand where the deep state analogy comes from, uh, because, uh, but but you know, it's easier to explain this. You, you don't have to use deep state analogies to explain what's going on. So the intelligence community is is um, being insulted by the president. The intelligent leaders in the intelligence community don't think that Donald Trump takes their work product seriously and disparages them. Um, yeah, we're just talking about humans and human nature here. Of course this stuff is going to leak out. I mean, and this is why, by the way, not to make a too large a point, but this is why I am 
at least somewhat sanguine about the future health of our open American democracy because you know the, it's a month into the Trump presidency. The free press is still free, right? The, ju the independent judiciary is independent, um, and the massive federal bureaucracy um, is having, uh, on, on occasions, an, an interesting and I think I would say appropriate immune response to some of the challenges that are being posed by uh, the White House. And, and these institutions are all working. Look, I'm a journalist. I'm pro-leaks, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, uh, but, but, but leaks are a way. It's not a perfect way, but it's a, per it's a way of people who are inside the system who believe something's wrong to make their case directly to the American people by going out to the media and having this air ventilated in public. Obviously, this is a controversial subject and Snow you know, the, the, the debate over Snowden, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 talking about these people as sort of deep state actors is is overdoing it in in, in, in in my mind. But you know, here's the thing: one of the things that presidents learn. I mean, this is the, the central irony, a central irony of the presidency, is that you're the most powerful person in the world and you have no power. You know, I mean, you 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 can do a whole bunch of things, including, by the way, as you well know from your job, blow up the world because you're in a bad mood. Um, uh, so, so you do have that, but it's very, very hard to work against the bureaucracy and win. It's very, very hard to declare uh, the press the enemy of the people and your own enemy and beat the press. Like that's that's a hard thing to do. You can't. You can call judges so-called judges, right? Um, but you can't. We think, or I think at least, you can't just ignore court orders. We'll, we'll find out we'll find if that's out. going to happen, but um, I, I think, I mean, this is all, again, we're all having a new, somewhat new experience here, mm -hmm. but I do think that, uh, I do think that the system, the systems remain the systems. Let me just go back to something you said about the intelligence community and, and you're a journalist and, and you like leaks. Are you, are you, you and your colleagues now who are where you were, um, before, are they see, is this a different world for them? Are they seeing a different amount of leaks, leaks coming? It is, it's not unusual for intelligence to leak. Look, Deep Throat was uh, the, the number two um, intelligence position, but from where you sit, is this different? Are you seeing more leaks coming, or is I don't it want more to of the I same? Can't, I'm not gonna characterize it for my own, my own self or our own institution. Mm -hmm. I would say that the, the velocity has increased. Look, look, they've gone, again, I go back to human nature. If you poke somebody in the eye over and over again, they're gonna get back at you because that's what people do. And how do you get back? You get back by saying, oh, by the way, Mike Flynn was talking to the Russian ambassador. Hey, who knew? <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you do the things that you do. Um, that's just, these are, these are human systems. Um, I do think, I mean, you, I don't have to tell you this, you could see it in the papers and, uh, every day, uh, that, that there are a lot of people, uh, and by the way, it'll be interesting over time, you know, right now we're focused on national security issues uh, to, to some degree, but let's just say, um, you know, Health and Human Services or the EPA or whatever, uh, uh, people don't like what's happening. Remember, you have, for instance, in the EPA, you have a guy who hates the EPA now running the EPA. Uh, He's been the sworn enemy of the thousands of people who work at the EPA. That's uh, a hard job. Doesn't seem like a recipe for uh, smooth, uh, you know, uh, happy hours and Friday afternoons at the EPA headquarters. I don't know. Um, and you'll 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 see some stuff come out. Again, this is a this is a safety valve for democracy. I believe it's a safety valve for democracy. It doesn't always work well. It's an ugly, ugly process, but it beats. It beats putting people in jail for telling reporters things that they think are true. Um, before, I guess before we go to, to um, your questions, you know, just ending where we are on democracy, this is just a speculation and, you know, every, everyone's kind of talking about it. You maintain your faith that the institutions will work. Um, one of the things I worry about is that the institutions are fragile. Yeah. Um, they're nothing but ideas and they only continue right. because we have a shared belief that it's important and yet they're being torn down constantly. This is how I felt a little bit about referring to intelligence as the deep state. It just, it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a constant pulling down of things that we didn't think you 
could tear down in the past. Do you yeah. what, what's your sense of the um, these institutions to fight back? You you'll know the media the best because you're in it. So speak from that or more generally. Well, the media is easy. I'm I mean, because we're just gonna it. you're just gonna du you double down. You double down some more. You know. I mean, if they what are they? I mean, I don't even see it as plausible they're gonna try to throw us in jail for stuff. If they throw me in jail, it's, I can at least get a nap. It'll be nice. I'll go to jail for a while and take an afternoon nap. But um, the, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like the, the, the discourse, the enemy of the peoples. The, I, I can't stand that. Uh, but I'm not chicken little or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, running around thinking that the sky is falling because. That's my job. Uh, that's your job. <laughs> that's right. Um, the, uh, <laughs> So, so I, one of the things that we've learned, or I've learned uh, over the past months, is that many of the things that we think are uh, governed by laws are actually just governed by norms. In President Obama, for instance, we had, and President Bush for that matter, we had presidents um, who were governed by the norms of the, B you know, there's nothing that says you have to travel with a press pool. There's nothing you said you have to have a press conference. There's nothing you have to say that, there's, there's to nothing to prohibit conference. a president from, um, demeaning the judiciary. Can't get fired for demeaning the judiciary. Just, just, most presidents don't cross, you know, don't cross those lines. Everybody knows where the lines are. There's a fundamental, I'm going to use this word very deliberately, there's a fundamental decency in the way they talk. Pres every word that comes out of a president's mouth has to be calibrated in order not to upset the norms that have kept us remarkably stable mm -hmm. for centuries. And, and we're in a different, that's what's, that's what's novel and un, unusual. But I, I do have, I do have faith in it. And yeah, I, I, I get very, I, I actually been thinking about this a lot in the last week. The uh, derogating or, or putting down government I mean, we have, I mean, you travel a lot, I travel a lot. We, we know that the United States Marine Corps, the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Institute, whatever it's called, however it goes, it's very long, uh, the weather people, um, <laughs> NASA, uh, uh, the Secret Service, the Coast Guard. Coast Guard's unbelievable. We, we, our government institutions are the envy of the world. We're the, we're the gold standard. All, all of these things that we do, millions of people do them well every day. And, and, and countries across the, I mean, there's, there's a reason that not every country has to have an FDA, for instance. It's because we have an FDA. There's a reason that Ebola didn't, murder half of West Africa. That's the CDC. Mm -hmm. And so this constant invective that's directed against, not to say the government is perfect, God knows, right? But this, this constant invective, this, this bringing down of government, I mean, it, the only thing that separates us from primitivism, from, from you know, the, uh, from very unpleasant very nasty, short, brutish life is, is, is robust government institutions for all their flaws. And so this is a, this is a I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people who, you know, I, I know most people watch those born movies and, and just, you know, you know, entertain. I find them entertaining too. But I'm always watching those movies, for instance. I, I'm not, so I'm not just blaming Trump. I blame, this has been a, this has been a discourse for years. You know, you watch these movies in which the U.S. government plays this utterly nefarious role. This is made by liberals in Hollywood, by the way. And you sort of say, you know, over time, you, you convince people that, that the government is worse than it is. We have some problems in the government. But uh, Donald Trump walks into an atmosphere in which there's yeah. profound mistrust. For the, I mean, you know, the people who are out protesting the government, also, you know, Social, Social Security sends, I don't know how many tens of millions of checks every month on time. That's not an easy thing to do. These things work. And we'll miss them if they're gone. Mm -hmm. And we'll miss them a lot. And so it would be nice to, it would be nice to have a, a little bit more of a balance in the way we talk about these institutions. Yeah, I would agree with that. OK, so it's now time for, um, for everybody else to get engaged. We hope we've set the table well to help you situate your questions. And you can line up behind the mic. There's clearly going to be a long line. So I ask you to keep your questions short. 
and then we'll give Jeff a chance to respond. Hi, my name is Matt Enlow, and I'm a second year student at the law school. Earlier tonight, you spoke briefly about how Obama and Trump might both reflect different versions of the American people, and I'd like to expand on that a bit more. The Condorcet jury theorem is a theorem in public choice theory that explains the effect where if a group of people is all at least better than half likely to get the answer to a question right, each extra person you ask makes the majority more likely to be correct. However, this theorem fails when the members of the group are not more than, likely to ha more than half likely to be right. It seems like foreign policy might not be a field where we want the will of the American people to be reflected on average. Okay, let uh, me stop you. Let me stop you there. So, so it, the to to try to take that that question is, I think where we're going is, and you might be able to interpret it better. But a sense that um, is American democracy really I'm just not about smart enough to understand uh, really that about the will? <laughs> well, I went to I went to I went to Donald Trump's alma mater, Penn. So <laughs> I don't. Uh, you went to Penn. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's talking The about. question I was going to ask is how do we best communicate foreign policy to the general public if it's something that they themselves might get wrong if we ask them individually? Mm. It goes against general intuition. Yeah. I, I mean, it's harder and harder. I, I mean, you know. I, thank you. I, I, I thank you. I, I know that um, I know that the MSM is uh, you know, a, a subject of, of mockery today, and that democratization that the, the internet has brought about is a good thing in many ways. But, you know, there was a time when people got their information from sources that did a fairly good job of filtering out bad information from good, and that presented to the American people, uh, again, this sounds almost condescending and, and archaic, but, but newspapers and the nightly news presented people sober and in-depth presentation of the world as they were understanding it, and people were able to make better choices about what to do in the world. And so I, I worry about the ability to communicate complicated ideas uh, about America's role in the world in an atmosphere that's saturated with alternative facts and gossip and, and all the sort of things that you have. I mean, the, the, the broader point, I, I guess, is that I think we are suffering, we are suffering in a way from a kind of uh, a fatigue, there's an historical fatigue, I don't know what you call it, it's been 25 years or more uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. The Cold War was an organizing concept in the United States. We happened to win it, um, but when we won it, we sort of withdrew from the world for a while, or withdrew thinking about the world uh, for a while. And part of this goes back to this thing I was talking about with the government. It's like, we, it, the reason that that we have, we can buy an iPhone when we want is because the US Navy is making sure that the international sea lanes between Asia and the US are free to piracy and, and rogue nations and, and, and all sorts of bad stuff, right? Uh, so when, but when you, when you we, we don't, and I don't think successive presidents have done a good job of explaining, like, a, we do things not only for mercantile reasons, although here's a perfectly good mercantile reason to invest in, in, in global sea lane security. Um, but B, if we didn't do the following 10, 20, 30 things, the world would look a lot worse than it is. We're, we're, in a way, we're victims of our own success. I don't know, I'm just sort of thinking this through because uh, it's a very interesting question. But um, I don't think past presidents have done a very good job of explaining and embracing the, the ideas of American indispensability. Obviously, the Iraq war was, is generally interpreted to be an overreach and a, and a tragic misapplication of American idealism and American interventionism, uh, and so we're, we're suffering the, the, the after effects of that. But anyway, I can go on, Thanks. but I won't. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, um, my name is Colette, and I'm a first year at Harris. And um, I was wondering, since okay, since Trump is an outsider, and he's continuing to bring these outsiders into office, like Nikki Haley and Rex Tillerson, um, do you think their role is going to be? I mean, obviously, everyone has to learn on the job, but in terms of having international political diplomat, like diplomatic experience, what is their role and? Are they going to be mostly cleaning up messes that comes from our messages here, or what do you see? Right. That? Thank you. So so far they've been mainly in the cleanup mode. Rex Tillerson hasn't really said anything in public yet, as Secretary of State, 
I guess he's just getting his feet wet or, or something. Um, so we don't really know much about his role. What we do know is that he was not uh, in the White House when Trump is having various bilateral meetings, Japanese Prime Minister, the Israeli Prime Minister, Canadian, right? Um, which is kind of odd not to have a Secretary of State there. Uh, and so the big question, uh, the big question is not whether these people are competent. Nikki Haley is very smart. Rex Tillerson ran Exxon Mobil. One assumes he's smart and can run large organizations. Uh, the big question is, will anybody in the White House care what they have to say? And that's an open question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us tonight. My name is Zubair, and I'm a second year in the college. And from my personal experience, I've seen a lot of similarities between President JFK and now former President Obama in their youth, their optimism, and their drive. Um, and President Kennedy left the presidency and kind of transformed the way that we view it. So in your opinion, how has President Obama transformed the way that we view the presidency and the office itself? That's a good question. I, I mean, you know, it's it's... It's, it's, it's interesting, I, I mean, you, so, so uh, I, I commissioned last week, I don't know where the thought came from, but uh, you should look at it on the web, it's very interesting, uh, on the Atlantic website. I, I called up Miss Manners um, to ask her to sort of refract the Trump mode of behavior through the prism of her particular concerns. Uh, and it's a fascinating piece, but, but she said, you know, it's, it's, she has a theory, and there's an actual person, Miss Manners, she, Judith Martin, she writes in Miss Manners, this is for the young people who don't know this. Um, and, and, and she has a theory that, you know, we, that the country was tired, in a way, of having such a staid, appropriate, dignified family man president who revered the office, and so, because we're trained in a way for the excitement and unpredictability of reality TV that we desire this guy to behave so badly, right? Um, I mean, what's, what's amazing to me, I guess, and I, I'm just thinking about it, because I, I, I got to watch President Obama fairly close up, um, and, and this is not a policy observation that I'm about to make, this is just a personal observation, is that no one, no one inhabited the role in, in, in as dignified, um, in a serious-minded and sober-minded way uh, than, than, than Barack Obama in, in my lifetime. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he understood the, the, the necessity to measure words. He understood uh, most of the time the symbolic importance of the presidency. Um, and, you know, you would think that that would have been, at least I thought, that that would have been a that he going forward is a role model for the way presidents should behave. Again, I'm not making an ideological or policy uh, arguments here, because you could argue about those things, but just in the manner in which he carried out the presidency and, and embodied the seriousness of the United States and the seriousness of the office, you would think that that would be, he would set the model going forward, but then we have someone who is clearly I mean, there, there are 330 million or so Americans, and no two Americans are less alike than Barack Obama and Donald Trump, um, just in terms of personality and disposition. So I don't know what long-term effect he'll have, because, it, because his long-term effect ended on January 20th. What, what about a centralization of kind of power in the executive branch? It's a continuation of a trend, but he seemed right. to really accelerate that. And, it, you know, one of the critiques is it really slowed him down too, because every every issue had forty-five people yeah. who needed to sign off on it. And what about that yeah, well, continued I mean, acceleration the, the, the of that critique, trend? And this is something that's worth debating. The real critique is that, you know, if you basically come down on the uh, 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 on the side of the idea that Barack Obama executed the office well, you know, there are a lot of people who are critical of the drone policy. Uh, from the left, and there are people on the right who are critical for, uh, of him for not doing enough on terrorism. But, but if you basically say, you know, here, here was a guy who took the job seriously and considered the law when he did what he did, uh, the critique is that uh, he amassed, th though he was res a responsible person, he amassed power in a way that could then be passed off to someone who's not as responsible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that's a very, very relevant critique, uh, that, that there's a reason that you don't want too much power 
resting in the hands of the president. And on a very particular issue, I would say that this is where Congress has abdicated its responsibility to, to make war, to declare war. You know, they, they, the Congress won't even consider, you know, authorizing the use of military force in places like Afghanistan. They don't want to get, they don't want to get their hands dirty. So all the power has accrued to the, it's not just the president, the nature of bureaucracy, and the president is, is, is the chief bureaucrat, the nature of the bureaucracy is to accrue power and accrue uh, responsibilities and, and accrue money and personnel, grow everything, right? Congress is supposed to be there to check it. So I don't, I don't blame the president alone for doing that. That's nature. Thank, Thank you. you very much. This may be a follow-up on your last point. The authors of the Federalist Papers wrote that whereas the president can act with secrecy and dispatch, it's the Senate that bears the long-run purposes of the country before the world. And so I wonder how you see uh, an actual conflict over control of foreign policy between Congress and the president playing out. For example, if uh, Trump seeks to uh, have a Yalta conference and then sanctions against Russia, and then Congress passes a very deliberate mandatory sanctions law over Trump's veto. How would that, uh, as a contest for control with really uh, enunciating very different goals play out? Thank you. Do I get the pass at any point? Yeah, I would pass on. Do I get the, I don't, there's no button where I can just like, uh, the, uh, but, but to, no, just to pick up, I mean, yeah. we're not seeing that, though, is right now, right? Well, on right? sanctions, we are. I mean, I mean what, what, it's, look, the Senate only does what's easy for the Senate to do. That's one of the lessons, right? So it's, it's very easy to sanction countries we don't like. The Senate, I mean, and, and the Senate doesn't have to pay the price for those things. The president, the executive, has to then go manage more complicated relationships because of that. The Iran deal, I mean, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but there's interesting observations to be made about, about that. But that, that is one area in which they're happy to be involved. But, but one of the, so, so, so going back to this, this, this point, you know, Congress doesn't want to take on the responsibility of actually voting up or down on military engagements. Right, because then you then you're on the record, uh, and they saw Hillary Clinton lose the presidency in 2008 because she was on the record, and nobody wants to get on the record. There's a larger point, and this is uh, it's almost political cultural in in a way is, is that is that there are very very few people anymore in Congress who want to make a specialty of foreign affairs, and only a slightly larger number who want to make a specialty of national security policy, military policy. Um, this is to our our detriment. Um, there are some smart people in the Senate, but very, very few people. You know, once the, um, you know, once John Kerry and Joe Biden left to serve in the previous administration, the Democratic bench was fairly emptied. Um, once John McCain and Lindsey Graham leave the Senate, um, that bench will be fairly empty. It, it, there's an interesting, I, I don't know what the explanation for, well, I mean, there's an obvious explanation for it, which is that your constituents don't vote you in or out uh, certainly don't vote you in based on your um, clever uh, position on, uh, uh, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh, or they don't, they don't, you know, they don't, they don't care about these issues the way uh, people in a farm state would care about agriculture issues, you know. So, so, so we have, we have a problem, it's two problems, it's lack of courage and lack of interest at the same time. <coughs> it's a terrible recipe, especially when you would like these people to check in inexperienced presidents, foreign policy, and national security inclinations. Thank you. In an era where people mostly have qualifications for their jobs, our elected officials have the same bare bones qualifications that were set centuries ago. Trump has experienced people running his business while he managed to convince his followers that inexperience is a qualification. The result is we now have an apprentice in chief, uh, in a, an apprentice in chief, and uh, we now have the Trump tilt a whirl. Will this lead to establishing actual qualifications for elected officials? No. <laughs> no. I mean, no. I don't think so. Do you? No. In our statement on the clock statement, we call, called out the need for expertise on key issues because it seems like it should. You don't go to knee surgeon or a heart surgeon for having 
no qualifications, but we've seen people routinely run on being an outsider and who do you want to have a beer with? And right. Look, well, when, when, again, Clinton, when, Clinton came, when President Clinton came in, he came in from, from Arkansas and there was a feeling he wasn't listening to the establishment. He brought his own guys yeah. in. It's a, you know, yeah. it's, a, it, it's gotten worse, I think. I, I go but. back to this point where you know, everything, there are a lot of things that we thought were governed by laws that are actually just governed by norms. Um, and it has been a norm that you find extremely qualified people to run complicated government departments. Right? That's just, uh, because uh, you know, it almost doesn't need to be legislated because why would that possibly be needed? Why, why would you possibly need legislation to say that uh, people with expertise in a particular area should be running large complicated government departments that deal with that area? That's where we're, I mean, that's where, you remember in the, in the, in the Brexit debate, I forgot one pro-Brexit uh, no. British, thank you, um, the, it, it said that, that the people are tired of experts. And it's like, this is an, in, an insane statement because as you, you know, it, it, and by the way, this, this, uh, I think about this a lot in the terms of the climate change debate. If you go to 100 oncologists, if a person goes to 100 oncologists and 99 of those oncologists say you have cancer and one says you don't, do you go home to your spouse and say, I don't have cancer? It's fantastic. I, I mean, climate change where you have 1,000 to 1 scientists saying that this is a thing and you have um, many people in one party who say it doesn't matter that all of science says that this thing is happening. I choose not to believe that. This is, this is a return to pre-enlightenment values. Not that I have an opinion about it or anything. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I want to talk about or ask you about something that hasn't come up tonight, and it's the relationship between big philanthropy and our foreign policy interests. But big philanthropy, I mean your your Gates, your Facebooks, your Bonos, and are we always working? Are they always working in consistency with our foreign policy goals, or do you think there are times where they're at cross currents? Hmm. It's interesting. Um, I was actually out in Seattle last week talking to Bill Gates about this, um, and you know, it's it's interesting because the, those the people you mentioned, I don't know much about Facebook and where they're going, but uh, are big internationalists, obviously Warren Buffett too, uh, and and are big supporters of the U of spending U.S. foreign policy. You know, they're big big defenders of, of, of foreign aid. Um, it is interesting. I mean, there's a there's a there's an interesting philosophical question about if you're Bill Gates. Um, you have so much money and so much power that you define for uh, governments in a way. I'm interested in malaria more than I'm interested in, in Y disease, so therefore I'm going to go do this. It's very hard to complain about Bill Gates spending billions of dollars to cure malaria, but it is interesting in a way the, the role that they play. But remember that there's another piece of it, which is that, that no matter how much the Gates Foundation, for instance, can spend on focusing on a particular education issue or a particular health issue. It's nothing compared to what governments can actually bring to the, to the table. But, um, and actually we're, we're, I think, again, like a lot of things, we're entering an interesting test period uh, in which we're gonna find out whether, um, whether places like the Gates Foundation align with the interests of the Trump administration. Remember, Gates, found, uh, the two people, or three if you count Melinda Gates, obviously, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, the three people who are responsible for saving more lives in, 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 in the world over the last 15 years are, are, are the Gateses and George W. Bush. For PEPFAR, the Malaria Fund, Global Fund, um, 10 million people, 12 million people. That was perfect alignment, right? Uh, but we, we, again, I'm, we're talking into, I'm talking into a vacuum here because we have not heard an articulation from Donald Trump about his views of the use of foreign aid. Hello. Uh, Hello. So uh, since the beginning of World War II, American foreign policy, largely to its detriment, has really been obsessed with looking at the world in terms of broad spheres of influence. Uh, and Trump, on the other hand, seems to utterly reject that notion. Uh, and instead, maybe due to his business background, really views the world almost anarchically as each country is an individual nucleus. Uh, do you think there ever will be any sort of synthesis between those two extremes? Dude. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I happen to tend to the to the to the former rather than the latter. I mean, the 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 every country as a as a as a as a as a its own nucleus and doing its own thing is a recipe for total disaster and and total warfare. I think um, that's why we have alliance. You know, we again going back to this point about we forget how bad things can be. You know, without the EU and without NATO. <laughs> it could be a lot worse than they are now. I understand your your your, your argument about um, about uh, spheres of influence, and we do get in trouble sometimes uh, uh, for that. But I would say that that there are a dozen countries in Europe, a dozen countries in Asia, a dozen countries in the Middle East that are are glad that they still exist within a U.S. sphere of influence. Because if the U.S. was not managing those regions, the way it's managing, those, the vacuum created by the U.S. absence would be filled by Russia, China, and Iran. And most of those countries that I'm talking about would prefer the U.S. for all of its faults and overreaching and, and, and its stupidities uh, to the U.S. to be the dominant power in those places rather than their non-democratic neighbors. Well, and also when you're dealing state by state, right, it, it there's no strategy. The reason you don't take on Sweden is because it it's, <laughs> doesn't seem point to, point to it. But if you're really serious about containing Russia, you don't want to make Sweden, right? That, that right. We, we create spheres of influence because there's some broader, bigger issue we're trying to tackle. And we need allies and support, right? right? To, right. to your point, right. Right. you need a web. You can't take every question on. Right, you, yeah. Yeah, you, can't, you can't have, I mean, we can't have 200 foreign policies. Right. Thank you. Next question. I think we have time. This will be the last one. I'm so sorry for the rest of you in line. Um, I recently read your interview with Senator Tom Cotton, and it kind of seemed like he was using the Trump presidency to kind of experiment with different ideologies that he had in his mind. Um, and this seems to be kind of a pattern. From he's ideologically, he's ideology fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how do you feel about um, generally politicians using different political situations to, um, you know, kind of broaden their principles and experiment with their <laughs> principles? Like, what do you feel about the downsides and potentially upsides of that kind of experiment? I like that expression, broaden your principles. Actually, <laughs> and, and what do we actually do have time for is answer that question. But if you're succinct, we'll a there's only three left. We'll ask you to each ask yeah, your question. Yeah, we we'll that. do a speed I, round I for the last be, three. So hold on, and I, I think we'll be able to fit that all in before um, 7.30. I have a slightly more cynical view of politicians than you do. Um, and you know, I, I, Tom Cotton is a very smart guy, uh, and he is, in a fa he is um, accommodating himself to the new reality. I mean, I said to him in this, uh, when we were talking a couple weeks ago, I, I said, um, I said, you know, you've always struck me as a kind of a Reaganaut, shining city on the hill, advanced democracy. And, and he said, he said, well, even cities on a hill need walls. And that's not something he would have said a year, a year ago. Uh, also, by the way, I'm not sure that cities on a hill need walls because they're on a hill. But I, and I, I didn't say that at the time. That was one of those, I should have said that. Uh, but <laughs> that's the point of building on a wall, on a hill, right? Um, but it, like he's he's accommodating himself. Like, well, one of the look, what's one of the biggest stories that we're dealing with uh, uh, today is uh, a surprising level of accommodation to by, by Republicans to a president who's not actually a Republican. This man is not actually. I mean, he doesn't subscribe to the the set of views and positions and values that we have associated with the Republican Party over the last period of time. So uh, there's a lot of accommodation to power. I wouldn't, you want to call it broadening principles, it's a, it's a good euphemism. So do we have time for a speed round or are we done, Steve? Um, you can take one last one here. All right. Wow. I tried, but we'll take the last one. Okay. Thanks, that's very nice of you. So me and my family are all huge fans of The Atlantic, um, and I just wanted to ask, given today's like sort of changing media atmosphere, what you talked about, how information used to be filtered, mm -hmm. and now it's not. And the fact that you also mentioned that um, you're not chicken little and you're not afraid of Trump throwing you in jail. There is also this notion that Trump has convinced a significant portion of the electorate to completely distrust the media. And that though- well, They were already might, halfway there. Right, right, I mean, right, I thought, yeah. right, right. And though I might see The Atlantic as an institution that gives voices to different perspectives, um, a lot of what the reality is that um, these media institutions are continually only being read by lots of people like the people in my family and the people in this room, namely sort of the intelligentsia. And right. that there is a broad rejection by a significant portion of the electorate of 
um, arguments based on evidence, arguments, arguments based on reasoned discourse. And I was wondering, as someone who is a leader in media and ha as a leader of an institution that has tried to remain bipartisan over a long period of time, um, what do you, duty do you see for yourself and people like you in institutions like the Atlantic to appeal to that portion of the American people and to sort of reunify us around talking reasonably about these issues? Thank you. You know, uh, it's a great question. I, I don't want to get grandiose and say that our role is to re reunify a fractured country, except that, interestingly, the Atlantic was founded in 1857 to reunify a fracturing country. <laughs> uh, so it's actually in the DNA of our, of our publication to want to do that, which is one of the reasons why I have decided that we're not going to go down the path that other publication institutions have taken, um, which is to enter the so-called resistance or the opposition. I am very, very interested in trying to figure out why people voted for Trump. I'm interested in people who voted for Clinton, too. Um, I, 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 I want to talk to them. I want to understand them. I have my doubts about the ability that we have to present stories produced in the traditional way, which is a accumulation of facts then analyzed by smart people who know things about the subject uh, at hand. Uh, I have my worries about that. I, I don't spend too much time thinking about that, though, because I, I almost feel like it's above my pay grade in a kind of way. I mean, I, it's the background noise for everything that we're worried about. I mean, I, I am worried about uh, I'm worried about the attack on enlightenment values of evidence-based discourse. One of the reasons I, I don't think about it that much is I, I do think that in the end of the day, facts have to win. I, I mean, because it, going back to the cancer analogy or, 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 or whatever you, you want to talk about, you know, it, it's easy as a candidate to say that climate change isn't real. It's easy as a candidate to say that we will smash um, Islamic terrorism. It's easy to promise, uh, it's easy to say, I will fix your problems. It's easy to say, I will get rid of crime. It's easy to do all those things when you're a candidate. Uh, it's hard to actually do those things in reality. And so I am. But won't it be too late when the repercussions of those things I sort think, of realize? I the whole, think it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. No. Uh, too late for what? I mean, right. you know, the you talk about you talk about living in a bubble of the intelligentsia. I would point out to you, just as an aside, that more people actually voted for Hillary Clinton than voted for Donald Trump. I mean, in terms of numbers, like the the, the bubble that you live in is fairly big. Uh, it's bigger than the other bubble. It's just a peculiarity of the American electoral system and a particularly weird election. Um, I, I do think at the end of the day, people understand that, 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 that they will be successful and have happy, healthy lives if they assimilate data in a reality-based way. And so that we will return to that kind of discourse and that the web, which is in its infancy, will figure out a way to disaggregate nonsense from, from reality. But maybe I'm being over-optimistic here, but I think that, that one other thing, and by the way, let me just end on this, because I think it's important. You know, I, I'm not making a specific plea for my own magazine, but, but everybody here has to understand that, that journalism just because you can get a lot of it for free doesn't mean it's, it costs nothing to make. And so the thing that we do right now, what we're doing is doubling down on trying to tell the truth in a fair way, right? But we can't do it if people won't fund that and allow us to do it. And so it's important to take out subscriptions. It's archaic, right? But it's important to actually subscribe to publications that you think are trying, at least, to get at empirical truth uh, so that you allow us to do that. We're having a great time in media right now. That's a little dirty secret of, of this moment, is that there's a lot of energy in media and that there's a lot of motivation and purpose 
for, for, for this because of this strange moment we're in, but we can't keep doubling down and doubling down without, without the, 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 the help of an informed citizenry. So Jeff, we have a, a clock here that is just at zero, and in my world, that's a terrifying yeah, countdown really. to get to zero. <laughs> so I think we need to, unfortunately, I know there's questions, but Steve, let me turn it over to you close the Well, program. I just simply want to ask all of you to join me in thanking Jeffrey Goldberg and Rachel Bronson.